All right, I will go ahead and uh, share my screen at least uh, to kick things off here. All right, we got a, uh, a good sized group. So I'll start by reiterating the participant norms. We definitely want this to be a participatory session. So uh, definitely feel free to chat in the text chat uh, all the way through. Um, if uh, if the speakers are, are speaking at the time, please use the raise hand uh, feature. We'll do our best to, uh, to call on you guys. Um, if, if Frank or Rick don't, one of us will, uh, will speak up. Uh, and then we, we definitely anticipate people will be unmuting and sharing as well. Last time we did this, it turned into a, a very open conversation. So feel free to do that, um, you know, at the point that you're not interrupting. Uh, and if you do need any help, use the help feature. That'll send a message directly to Ron, who's the host. Um, but uh, if you put it in the chat, one of us will jump in and be able to help you as well. That said, I want to uh, only very briefly introduce our uh, capstone session speakers. We are thrilled to once again have Frank White back. Uh, as I introduced this morning, Frank uh, coined the term the overview effect uh, with the first edition of his book in uh, 1987. It's now in its fourth edition. Uh, during the, the wrap up comments, I'll, I'll share that as well, uh, and as well as a link to it. So we're, we're thrilled to have him here. His work gave birth to the human space program, uh, which uh, Frank is very involved in now. I'm, I'm thrilled that I get to participate in the overview roundtable on a weekly basis, uh, where Frank um, you know, hosts a conversation like this with a very diverse group of people in all different fields from all over the globe. So we're excited to have him here today to, uh, to talk with us more about that, about uh, long-term uh, large-scale space migration and about how we might prepare uh, the current generation of students for that. Um, also really thrilled to have uh, Rick Tumlinson here. Uh, among other things, Rick is the, uh, the founder of the Earth Light Foundation, and I hope he'll be sharing some of their founding principles with us today. Um, uh, Frank is also involved in many aspects of the space industry. He's a founding partner with Space Fund, uh, where they're building out the, uh, the infrastructure of uh, the growing space economy. Uh, I also hope Rick might uh, talk a little bit about that today. Um, he runs a conference himself called New Worlds, which I was also very excited to be able to get to go to uh, this past year uh, in Austin and uh, just brings together a lot of the movers and shakers, but uh, not in a way you might expect because it's very much a space philosophy experience more than anything. So uh, I think both of these gentlemen are true space philosophers, uh, which makes me very excited to have them here. Uh, but uh, I want to uh, kick it over to them if they if they want to make any opening remarks. Uh, we do have a few uh, few questions to ask, so I'm actually going to jump out of the uh, the shared slides here so that we can see them in speaker view. Um, but Frank and Rick, if you guys want to uh, make any opening remarks, uh, go ahead now uh, while I'm digging up the questions. Great, great. Go ahead, Rick. Um, <laughs> after you frank um so yeah thank you i'm honored to be here um in front of a group of the probably some of the most important people on the planet uh educators um the as i was saying before we started the session forgive me i lose my voice i i as i was saying earlier uh before some of you got here i did a lot of shouting and screaming yesterday morning and um, uh, in a good way um, because uh, I was watching history being made and uh, with the, the flight of Starship. Um, yeah, so to dive in, um, we really are at a moment of incredible possibility, incredible change and incredible threat. Um, one of the things I, I, I talk sometimes about is the fact that we are at the end of maybe near the nearing the end of one of the most important hundred years in the history of humanity. Um, and if you believe like I do that um, um, sentient life um, may only be on this planet, um, 
And the only reason I say that is because when I'm, if I play cards and I don't play cards much, but uh, I have to bet on the cards I can see. And this is the one that I can see. This is the world that I know of. This is the world where I live. Mm -hmm. And we have been unable to, to really find uh, signs and signals. My friends at SETI or whatever of intelligent life in the universe. So I'm going to bet on this one. It, I, you know, it's just a smart thing to do, even if they're out there. Right. Um, and when I look at this planet, um, I look at the last hundred years. So you go back to, let's say, 1940, roughly 10 to 20 years, either side of that. You had um, the world pretty well had met itself coming the other way. Uh, we had global communications. We had the first global pandemics. We had uh, the rise of nuclear power. We had the rise of rocketry, uh, global war, um, the radio, television. All of those things all happened around that time. Um, here we are. About 100 years later, let's say, moving into 2030, 2040 zone. Um, and those very same technologies offer us the capability to uh, destroy ourselves completely um, and to create a future of immense excitement wherein humanity and life itself um, can expand off the mother world and into the universe. Um, the ironies, the complexities, the just the the thought provoking aspects of that can blow your mind. It it is the same technologies that can wipe us out, that can lift us. It is the same technologies that were designed to carry those weapons to wipe us out, that can lift us off of the planet out into the universe. So that's that's the challenge we have in front of us. Um, and then of course climate change, uh, more correctly global warming. Um, that's facing us. We've got a generation in my talk. I, I, um, the space revolution, it's a, a talk I do. Um, I, I point out that, you know, we're, we're handing this generation, um, you know, it's like clean up on planet three. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we plundered and pillaged the whole place and, uh, kids, uh, if you don't mind cleaning this up, it's all yours, you know? Um, and that's a terrible thing to say and a terrible thing to, to hand a generation. Um, and so what we have the possibility of doing is flipping that around and, and saying, you know what, these technologies, um, that, that can kill us can transform us. And, and so I come at this after 40 years of working this cause. And a lot of what we've been doing over these years has been sort of almost like we're trying to rationalize to our parents why space is important, you know, oh, mom, you know, we, you know, it's, we're going to make some money out there. And, um, you know, we uh, we have uh, the resources. I, I founded one of the first asteroid mining companies many years ago. Um, we got some resources. We can go out there and get those. And, uh, um, you know, people can travel out there and look around. I, I hate the T word. I have fought against it. I signed the first private astronaut, a guy named Dennis Tito. Um, I signed him up. I hate the T word. We won't use that one here. But, you know, we have people who can pay to travel to go out there. Um, all of these different great things. And they're all very rational sounding, strategic I, I do a little work with Space Force, uh, things like that. These are all great. They're fantastic. They're important. Every one of them are very important things. Um, and you might call those your your uh, your left brain rationales. Um, but this is bigger than that. Far, far, far bigger than that. Far, far more important than that. And that area of importance for me is, is, is when I started looking into that a, a few years ago, I was literally on a... Uh, I lost my mom. I was walking around a pasture outside of our home. Um, I was vulnerable. I was open. I was ripped open and um, had been fighting this fight, was not sure what I was going to do, where I was going to go with it. Um, and I began to just get this feeling um, that there was so much more. I, I, I call it the calling. Uh, many of you have the calling. I felt the call. And, you know, I felt love, incredible, intense love from the mother world, Earth, I felt love from the universe. And I started thinking, you know, this is what it's all about. It's something here in, in our heart, in our soul, much more important. Everything else is a rationalization. Everything else is a mechanism. Everything else is a tool. Everything else is a means of achieving these things. And so to dive right into that, I, I started Earthlight. For many years, we just ran a few conferences. We're starting to get more active now. And the Earthlight Foundation comes from the idea that, I'll put it this way, 
imagine we're all standing on the edge of the frontier. Right here next to us is the frontier. Frank and Mark and all of y'all and Elon and Jeff and Firefly and all these other people's companies, they're all standing on the edge of the frontier. On this side of, uh, on that side of the frontier is the undiscovered country of the universe. And on this side is our history, who we are, where we came from, what we've done, good and bad and indifferent. And we know more about our history than any time in human history ever. We are actually able to look almost to the beginning of the galaxy um, or the universe itself. Um, and we have an understanding every, every year I, or every week almost, I find out, oh, human civilization was older. Tool making occurred more in the past, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Me Too and Black Lives Matter are us learning about our, our, our past in, in, in new ways. These are folks showing up going, you know what? You've been looking at history this way. I see it from over here and I see it from over here. And that makes our ability to understand history even richer than it's ever been. Uh, you know, the people that lived in Rome in, in the first few century, uh, centuries of, of you know, this, this era thought it had been built by giants. They had, they had no understanding of, of where that came from, but we do. And we know what we've gotten wrong. And we, as we start to enter this frontier and to cross into this place, have a moment in time that has never happened at any moment in history, at any time when humanity has expanded into new realms, to have the knowledge of what we have done right and the ability to understand what we have done wrong and to put those two things together and look at a future and say, hey, maybe we can go here differently. Maybe this time we can literally raise ourselves to a new level. So that's what Earthlight is all about. And in Earthlight, we have what we call the three principles of purpose. They are part of a book that is someday will get written by me. Um, I literally am on Adderall right now. I am ADD and I'm going to figure it out. I'm going to get the book out there. But we have the principles of purpose. So the principles of purpose break down into three parts. The first one is to protect and expand the domain of life. We have to protect the mother world. And we in Earthlight, Earthlighters believe, and by the way, you can be an Earthlighter and part of any other organization. We don't care. You could even work for Boeing. I'll give you that much, right? Anybody, you can be a part of this. Um, and what we believe is it is our goal, our job as living creatures to carry the seeds of life to places that are now dead. And that's in our credo. Then there is to honor and evolve human civilization, to honor I honor where you came from. I honor everybody on this screen. I understand whether you're left, right, center, blue, green, purple, brown, plaid. I don't care where you come from. I don't care who you are. I don't care your religious faith. I don't care. I honor that. So long as you join with me and I can join with you in a new way of being as we rise above into this new place and evolve human civilization. You know, there are people I, I, I love to point out when I talk that um, there's one place in the solar system where Russians and Americans don't just uh, live together. They love each other. And it's 150 miles up. and It's called the space station. And I know a lot of y'all know astronauts and cosmonauts. You know what? Those people do love each other. They care about each other. We have ahead of us and above us in space a model of how we can be and who we can be. It's perfect. It models everything that this new generation needs to see. There's no greater environmentalist than somebody floating in a tin can above the earth, breathing, rebreathing her own air, redrinking her own urine and seeing the earth fly below. That's an environmentally aware person. And then we move to the last to explore and experience everything in the universe. And I'll wrap this up here in a moment to explore and experience everything in the universe. It's a matter of we are the sensing mechanisms, and Frank shares this as well. We are the sensing mechanisms by which the universe knows of itself. And I love talking like to my biblical friends. I'll say, you know, God, according to your books, the, the, the ancient books, you know, God created uh, everything. And he told uh, Adam and Eve, go out and name the things I've created. Well, they weren't all in Eden, and they're not all on this planet. We have to get out there. We have to explore and experience. And I'll wrap it up with this. I, um, there's a place you can be as a human being, that is the most exciting place you will ever be or that you've ever been as a human being in your life. And you will remember these places because these are the places when you stepped beyond the knowing of where you are and moved into the uncertainty of what you can be and became something new by doing something different, something new, something unexplored, something you've never tried. I have a picture I love to show of my daughter touching a living flower for the first time. That's a transformational moment, that instant in time at which she moved 
from the certainty of what she was, the universe that she thought she knew, and literally created by that act of adventure and exploration, a new universe that she could live into. And my challenge to humanity is, what if we took that and made that who we are? If we got away from how much you own, how many Teslas you have, how many likes you can get, all of that, and instead of that, focused our being on what we can become and who we can be and how we can do it together and open up a new universe of possibility and have a civilization that exists in that moment that kind of Star Trek moment, <laughs> in that moment of exploring the unknown, becoming better than we are, including all of us as we go out there and take on, enjoy, experience, and explore the universe by which the universe, which is otherwise dead rock and energy, becomes alive through our consciousness. There you go. Those are uh, some ambitious opening remarks. I love it. I love it, Rick. Thanks so much. Uh, I think we'll have to cycle back, Rick, and talk, um, maybe revisit those principles and talk a little bit about the Permission to Dream project. But let's give, uh, let's give Frank an opportunity to, uh, to share some opening comments as well. Hmm. Yeah, I think we should really stop there, actually. That was a brilliant, brilliant beginning, which I knew it would be. Uh, let me just say this. Rick and I met, I don't know, 35, 40 years ago. Uh, working with Gerard K. O'Neill, a brilliant mentor to us and many other people who are in the space community today. And both of us have been uh, working to try to understand this unique moment in time. Uh, Rick just shared some of his findings. I think what's remarkable is that we've more or less come to the same conclusions. We don't express it the same way, but that's okay. Uh, different people can understand it in different ways from, from different um, people who are, are sharing their insights. But um, I would say a few things that go along with what Rick was talking about. One is this, the overview effect, which is that experience of astronauts seeing the earth from space and in space, that's a big paradigm shift. Uh, it has already had an impact on the thinking of earthlings. And as more and more people have the experience directly, um, you know, it's going to create an even bigger shift. And, you know, Starship's going to be a big part of that. Uh, my connection to that launch was that I was at the wedding of Mary Liz Bender and Ryan Shalinsky, uh, and we were literally in the shadow of the space shuttle Atlantis, which was is at Kennedy Space Center. And uh, Mary Liz and Ryan had to leave. They couldn't have a honeymoon because they had to be at the launch to record it. <laughs> And uh, and also Mary Liz had to be there to be with Tim Dodd, the everyday astronaut, who is planning to go on one of those spacecraft on the Dear Moon mission. And so, as I always say, please know that if you want to go to space, all of you, you're there. We are in space right now. We're on an organic spacecraft called the Earth, and you're all astronauts right now. The difference is when you experience the overview effect, you'll know it directly. We know it intellectually, but we do not know it experientially. So we've had this incredible paradigm shift that's just going to expand. And one of the things that Rick talked about, a couple of things that I want to echo, I said at Mary Liz and Ryan's wedding, I'm, I'm a slow learner. <laughs> Taken me 35 years to figure out the overview effect is about love. It's about love of the earth. It's about love of the universe. I'm now getting astronauts who confess to me they cry when they see the earth for the first time. 
in that way. Um, and I also get, I'm getting astronauts who tell me they love the universe. They love being out there. And that's really counterintuitive because that environment is not hospitable to humans. And yet I'm getting astronauts who tell me I kind of didn't want to come back. I felt at home out there. There's something pulling us outward. And this goes back to the philosophical aspect. I've asked myself, isn't it remarkable that after all the years of evolution on this planet, our species has been evolved with the ability to become a multi-planet species? Why is that? Most of the answers, as Rick was saying, well, we're going to make money. We're going to make nonstick frying pans. Uh, we're we're going to experience the overview effect. I mean, it's all about us. And what caused me to say I was going to be a space philosopher was after the Challenger accident, I saw a TV program called This Week with David Brinkley where Tom Wolfe asserted, we've never had a philosophy of space exploration. And I decided we needed one. So I'm not really trained in that field, but I've never been shy about invading other people's fields. And so I became a space philosopher that day. And I, asked, I, I started looking at what we were telling people about this and as Rick concluded, I concluded it was all human-centered. Uh, what are we going to bring to the universe? What are we going to bring to the solar ecosystem? And I believe we're going to be bringing life, uh, self-awareness or awareness, consciousness, uh, to this larger ecosystem. And we have to understand the universe has allowed us to get to the point where we can do it. And, you know, it may seem like a big leap to think of what we can do for this cosmos, or cosma, as I say. But through the overview effect, we've come to understand that the Earth is not something to exploit for our own ends. We need to be in a symbiotic relationship with the Earth. And I think the new philosophy of space exploration is to be in a symbiotic relationship with the cosmos. I'll just close with one last thing that I think is very important, and it is self-centered for the species in a way. I really think we have to move from mission to migration. And I say, I say that for the benefit of Earth and the cosmos. I can give you all the reasons I believe this, but for now I'm just going to assert that I believe there's good evidence that we have really gone beyond the carrying capacity of this planet. I think we're living on borrowed time. We're the kids in the basement who won't move out. <laughs> Mom and dad don't want to tell us to get out. And yet that's what we really need to do. And it's gonna benefit them and they're gonna breathe a sigh of relief when we go. Um, so it's time to go, you know? And the other thing I wanna say is, we well, have to go big or don't go at all. We're so far beyond the carrying capacity with our population and also with our industry and our high-tech civilization, this has to be a big project. That's why we founded the Human Space Program. It's a central project for all of humanity for a sustainable, ethical, and inclusive evolution into the solar ecosystem. It really does have to be intentional like Apollo was, but on a much, much bigger scale. A few million people is going to be fun. It's going to be singing the song, Wouldn't It Be Nice? 
I know I won't sing it for you. It would be embarrassing. But we have to start singing, We Gotta Get Out of This Place. That's another song uh, that I won't sing for you. But the immensity of what we need to do now as a species is so far beyond the missions that we're so engaged in right now. We are talking about large scale space migration. And I know it's hard for people to grasp, but I, it, it means billions of people moving outward. And the final point I would say is this requires flipping the script because a lot of people look at us. There are 51 of us here. They look at us and they say, oh, you want to abandon the earth. You want a gated community out there for the rich people. And Rick has warned against the Elysium effect where people think what we want to do is go live wonderfully out there on, in O'Neill communities and leave everyone else back here on a deteriorating planet. That is so far away from it that it's really sad. And so what we have to do is flip the script. And when you talk about space ethics, there's a mega ethics question. Who is more ethical? Those of us who want to leave without abandoning the planet or those who want to hunker down here and use up all the resources and, you know, not go anywhere, not do anything, and have a stagnant civilization. It's a communications challenge. That's why this is such an important day in what you all are doing. It's education. And that's what we've got to do. And, you know, I applaud everybody who's here and everybody who's here can help flip this script and change the paradigm. Uh, and that's what we really, really need to do. It's quite important and it's quite urgent. So I'll stop there and uh, we'll see where we go from here. There are a number of points I would love to cycle back to and I hope they'll come up in, in the Q&A. Um, and if not, I'll, I'll, I'll prompt. But I, I do wanna give you guys one of the prompts that, that we agreed to to kind of kick things off here and then we'll, um, we'll let everybody pipe in with, with questions too. Uh, but, and you, you provided a perfect segue. Communicating all of this to billions of people is important, uh, which means our education systems are gonna be important. And we started this morning asking how we could best prepare our kids for the growing space economy and for humanity's multi-planet future. But we were thinking in terms of 10 years, 15 years, right? Uh, but permanent presence on the moon and people on Mars. When we talk about this sort of large scale migration and we, we, we think in terms of the vision that both of you have laid out, what do you see as the role of children in that? Uh, and, and how might we, we help prepare them? Mm -hmm. You guys can answer in, in any order and then we'll, we'll transition to follow-up questions. Back to Rick. Okay. Back to Rick. Um, well, I should mention, by the way, one of our the flagship project that we're preparing um, and we announced uh, at South by um, is is called Permission to Dream. And Permission to Dream, we've been giving an award out to educators for several years at the Space Cowboy Ball. Um, and the the concept is that only you can give yourself permission to dream, and only you can take it away. Um, and our big audacious goal is, um, and, and this is not pie in the sky, we are going to put the infrastructure together to try and make this happen, is that um, any child on Earth who wants to look through a telescope will have that opportunity, um, which means putting a telescope in every, potentially every school on the planet. Um, and we're moving fast and we're going to be moving hard to make this happen. This, um, and the reason we took that on is... Um, as one of our goals, one of our projects, it's not the only one, is that um, if you've ever looked through a telescope or you recall the first time you ever did, it's a transformational moment and it happens early on. And if the rest of the context is there, 
um, then that can lead to a lot of good things. And, and that's the other part of this. The, the rest of the context. Um, I also, uh, you know, Frank's the nice guy. And, and then I sometimes like butt heads with like NASA and people like that. And so this idea, for example, this Artemis program, which is, is hey, it's kind of exciting. We're repeating what we did in, you know, the 60s and all of that. That's great because people get to watch it again. You know, it's like when they do a remake of like a TV show, right? And um, except it's got new actors and a younger crowd and, and you know, and, and it fits the mores of the time because it's inclusive and everything. Maybe back in the 60s, it wasn't. Okay, fine. That's all wonderful. It's not fast enough. It's not big enough. It's not, in, it, not inclusive enough. Um, and so that's one reason I work with the private sector. Uh, people like Elon and Jeff and Firefly and Rocket Lab. Um, we have got to widen the pipeline. We have got to dramatically increase the number and types of people um, and entities and enterprises that are, that are opening the frontier. We have roughly four potential space facilities right now. Um, and for example, and this is, this is really micro level and, and I'll, I'll, I'll hash on this, but I have to run around, like we invested in a company called Axiom. I love Axiom. They're going to build a private space facility, but they keep running around saying we are going to be the replacement for the space station, which is old school thinking, right? I don't want one space station replacing another space station. I want buildings on the orbital street, building a new community that encircles the earth and grows outward from there. And so we have to break through this old style thinking of a few people have the right stuff and the rest of us get to watch it on TV. You know, your kids in your classrooms have the right stuff. They just need to be given as many possible opportunities um, and, and means of, of, uh, of achieving their goals and going out there and making it happen. And by the way, as that few number of students, you know, we know it's a small percentage out of all of your students, go for those sorts of achievements, like literally planning to become leaders of groups that will, as, as Frank calls it, migrate to Mars or the moon or free space, which is my favorite place. Um, the rest of them are going to get lifted by that excitement as well. And they're going to do better in their careers. We know that y'all are educators. You know that better than I do. Um, so it's really a matter of expressing the excitement and the urgency and creating the opportunities. And let's not be satisfied with breadcrumbs of, of you know, massive government projects that move it. I, I am not excited by four or five people camping out on the moon in 2035. That just doesn't, doesn't light my fire. And you shouldn't be either. And you have to really push to say, we want more. We want bigger. We want faster. Let's go. Okay. Um, so agreeing with everything that Rick said, I would also add a couple of things. One is what role can children play? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, if children say to their parents, I want an Xbox, <laughs> you know, they're likely to get an Xbox. Children have an enormous impact on adults. And so if children really knew what's going on, if they were educated, in what is going on, they would have an impact right here and now uh, in the sense that they would tell adults how this is really, really important. And that's one thing. And the other thing is, uh, you know, if we are able to have this shift in the paradigm where people understand that migration is going to benefit the earth and it's going to alleviate some of the challenges we have on the earth and therefore make this planet a better place for their kids, then that is going to be a motivation, motivating factor because parents will do anything for their kids. And, you know, one of the projects we started at Human Space Program is called Donna's Project. And that's in honor of my late wife, Donna, because that's what she cared about, families and children. Large-scale space migration wasn't her thing, 
but insofar as it had anything to do with families and children, she'd have been interested in it. And I, I just feel that, again, this goes back to education, and it also will motivate the kids to believe in a positive future. And I worry about children, given the media environment they're in, the social media environment they're in, they don't see a positive future. They really don't or they're not being encouraged to. And so that's a general comment. I do want to say in very practical terms, and Anahita doesn't know I'm going to do this, it's a shameless plug, but Anahita and I have written a children's book called Star Sailor. It's essentially an overview effect for kids. And that's the kind of thing we can do. That is to say, we can create media that is directed to kids. And I'm not saying our book is the best ever written about the topic or the only thing. Going back to what Rick said about Axiom, we've got the only space station. But I'd like to encourage all of you, if you love kids and if you have grandchildren, you know, think about how you can create something that will not just appeal to adults, but it will be there for the kids, both for the kids themselves, but also for the impact they can have on everyone else. Even, even uh, politicians have kids. Uh, you know, I know it's hard to believe sometimes, but people who are important in terms of where our space future is going, they care about their children. And that, I'm just going to close. When I first started interviewing astronauts and I asked them about the Association of Space Explorers, which was radical and disruptive when it was started, one of the American astronauts said, you know, when we got together, uh, we didn't really talk about space missions. We talked about our children very human and that's what we have to get to is the the human side of this this adventure well that is well put and i i think oftentimes our schools leave something to be desired and being places where it's it feels good to be human uh so that's that's a great aspiration to rise to let me uh, open this up then to all of the participants. As Frank mentioned, we got more than 50 people here. Um, we've heard some really thought provoking stuff from, from Rick and from Frank. Um, we certainly have some prompts in mind if we, we are in need of them, but I wanna throw it out to everybody else. Feel free to drop uh, questions in the chat. Uh, and Aziz, if, if you wanna ask your question yourself first, since you, you're leading us off, go ahead and uh, unmute. We'd love to, to see you and hear you. Actually, uh, this is great. Uh, uh, listening to Frank and Rick, okay. And I think we are uh, again going to our uh, main question as humans. Uh, and I learned this from you, Frank, okay, that we are explorers. Yes, we are explorers, but we are looking for a promised land, okay. And this promised land is inside us and out there in the universe. So the question is how to reach that. And uh, a convention like this is very important because it gives us uh, the aspect to, to think about that. And we are going to ask the same questions again. So the question is how do we go to the next step? Hopefully we can do that. And thanks a lot. Well, I've been thinking about this a lot, Aziz, and of course, um, Aziz is a student uh, at the Kepler Space Institute, shameless plug again, and I know he's given, <laughs> he's given a lot of really insightful thought to, I, I'm not saying space religion, but uh, the, uh, the religious overtones of space uh, exploration and development and I think to some extent, we are looking at 
the at most immediately the solar ecosystem as the promised land. That is to say, a place where, as Rick was talking about, we can avoid the mistakes made in the past here on planet Earth and create a new kind of civilization that is is built on new principles and new understanding, new philosophies. And, you know, the one thing I would say about the promised land of the Bible is that it has a commonality with the frontier of the American West, where in order to uh, move into the promised land, the people had to displace others. In order to move into the West, the Europeans had to displace others. As far as we know, that's not an issue in the solar ecosystem, in the solar system. So we really do have a unique opportunity and uh, and I think we what we're all about here is how can we make the best of it? You know, how can we how can we do it? How do we do it? If you're if you're looking at what I am talking about, it is so much bigger than what we're doing right now. It is going to take a planetary commitment to the cause. And we don't have that. That's why I keep coming back to communication and education. We would need a commitment to do this that would really involve so many more people than we have today that uh, I, I can only say we have a huge task ahead of us. But, and I'll close on this, um, it is not a matter of resources or technology or any of that. It's a matter of will. We could do what I'm talking about in 10 years if we had the will. And, you know, even though it was a government program, when John F. Kennedy said we were going to go to the moon by the end of the decade, Nobody knew how to do that. Then nobody knew how, but he said we're going to do it, and and we did it. <clears throat> Elon Musk, I know for a fact that there were people who said reusable rockets are not possible, and you know, um, we look at the way Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos and others are proceeding. They're doing things that experts said couldn't be done. So uh, this, this idea of large-scale migration may sound way beyond the possibility of doing it. But Aziz, I think the first step is asserting that we're going to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I'm right there with you, Frank, and I'm glad I have to answer after you this time. Um, everything Frank just said, and, um, look, wow. Um, we're in a moment of paradigm shift. And, and the, the funny thing about paradigm shift moments is you don't know you're in a, most of the, most of the culture doesn't, right? Uh, a friend of mine pointed out that, um, uh, one of the Kings, oh God, I, I, Ferdinand or, or somebody in, in that period of time, uh, was writing the first draft of their, uh, their memoirs and um, didn't even mention this quote unquote new world thing, right? It was like 30 years after Columbus, right? It was more important, like, you know, which princess was dating which prince and see, you know, and Leon and all this type of stuff going on um, because they didn't notice it. And that's where we are now, you know. Um, we get caught up in this stuff. In fact, I, I ran into not to name drop, but I, I ran into Elon last night and I um um I kind of apologized to him because I gave him a hard time on Twitter when he took over Twitter. And and what I did was I I, I tweeted out, I said, Elon, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, I said, Elon, you got one job, dude. You got one job. Get us off this rock. You know, that's it. A thousand years from now, you're gonna be judged on whether you did that or you didn't do that. Um graffiti, I don't care about a graffiti. I don't care about the gossip, which is what so much of this other stuff is 
right? Um, now he came back and he said, well, I'm trying to save civilization. Da, da, da. Uh, by the way, last night when I said that to him, he said, well, you, you were actually right. You're right. You know, and um, maybe that's because he's been at Twitter, you know, for the last two months. He's like, oh, what have I done? But anyway, the, the point is that we, we were in this paradigm shift moment. And when Starship lands, not takes off, when it lands, when we have the reusability of space ships, and by the way, Frank and I are big language guys, and, and I'm very much on like, I don't talk about launchers. I talk about rocket ships because you don't throw ships away. You don't throw spaceships away, right? Um, and when we get to that point, that's the railroad, that's the airplane, that's the steamship all at once. And and I like to make the joke. That's also when the Balkans show up and welcome to the you know Federation. But that's a you know, uh, but look, we're there. You know, there, if if you were in, um, I don't know if you ever saw the old movie Amadeus about like how Amadeus was such a big rock star and all that. But if you're back in like the 1500s and 1400s, let's say, and you're at the cocktail party and there's this young uh, person in there explaining with great wisdom and seriousness how God created the celestial spheres and rotated the planets and the sun around the earth. And that's where the heavenly music comes from. And everybody's like, oh my gosh, this is, this person's brilliant. Oh my God, this person's got it all figured out. Okay, then you go post Copernicus, they're an idiot, right? So a lot of the debates we run into and your teachers, so you run into them in your classes, right? You're gonna run into uh, I had a friend named a friend of mine named Arcus Anderson. He's a former NFL player. He was at our conference. He was uh, heavily involved with us on this thing. And he comes from what some people, and I do not use the word, would call the woke movement. And he hung out with us for two or three days at Earthlight. And then afterwards, we're at the post thing. And he's he's talking to me. He's like, Rick, oh, man, I love everything you guys are talking about. But, you know, we're still dealing with the colonialist, capitalist. And he, I let him roll for like 10 minutes. And I said, dude, everything you're saying, I totally agree with. And none of it applies in the new paradigm. We're not taking land from somebody much to the chagrin of the people that already live there. We are not, um, we're not attacking the ecosystem, which has been the characteristic of industrial civilization ever since the, the dawn of fire, the expansion of humanity has meant an attack on everything outside of the light of that fire. We've moved outward and crushed everything before us. This is a flip. We're going to plant seeds where there are no living things. We're gonna have butterflies on the moon, trees on Mars, right? So when your kids are confronted by this, by people that are using this old paradigm attack, you have to stop it and go, whoa. You know, and my friends are, I, I have some friends who like use the word eco. Oh, you're going to destroy the ecology. Do you, do you really understand the, the roots of that term? You, you, do you really understand where that word comes from? Right. We, we are carrying life out there. And I, and I like to say, like, would you rather rip the heart out of a living ecosystem on the earth to get your precious metals for your electric economy or take them from a dead rock floating in space that might kill us? These are the kind of discussive arguments you have to have because your kids that you're dealing with are unarmed. They don't know how to, to deal with that. And other teachers who maybe not space conversant like you all are, 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 are hitting them with this other stuff, right? And they're hearing it all over the place. They need to be armed and educated with the idea that, hold it, this is different. My future that I get to create as a child as I step into the role of leadership in my life is is one of possibility not guilt not not fear i have the chance to make things better and you know what my parents may have helped screw it up but i get to create a better future you know we have to give them that that hope that possibility there you go sorry Hey, uh, for me, that's that's inspiring. It, uh, it, and I can actually feel my my own uh, paradigm shifting uh, listening to this conversation. I'm, I'm looking out at a couple of the questions we have here. Um, and and I'm going to skip ahead to the, the most recent one here, to, at least to start. What do you think it will really involve to include 
everyone. And actually, I'm I'm sorry. I don't. I I should invite um, M. Badawi to uh, to come up and ask this himself first. Uh, if you want to unmute and ask your question, maybe put a little more uh, a little more nuance to it. Yeah, I'll be glad to. I'll try to be uh, quick with it. Uh, there was a presentation by the Celestial Citizen uh, about space urban planning. Uh, most part of it uh, was about uh, how to include everyone, how to make this participatory and collaborative effort. So my question is, uh, I don't know if you guys can hear me because my, my screen froze. Oh, we got you. We hear you loud and clear. Thanks. But we did. I think we have the substance of his question, though. Um, you know, is it? Can I speak? Oh, oh, go ahead. Yeah, we hear you fine. We hear you fine. Yeah, yeah. I, I my screen froze for a bit, so I'll try to be uh, as short uh, with this question and quick as possible. Uh, there was a really great pre uh, presentation today by the Celestial Citizen about space urban planning, uh, and in in like in every slide or two, there was a. Uh, uh, an idea or a thought about uh, including everyone, about how to make this participatory enough, how to make a, a global collaborative effort. Uh, there's this notion about uh, the Artemis, Artemis Accords uh, as one example, but my question was, what would it really take to involve and include everyone on Earth, if that's even logical and plausible enough to think? And if not, uh, where are we headed? Like uh, many countries have already uh, landed uh, on the moon and they're planning to land on Mars and et cetera, et cetera. Well, I would, uh, <clears throat> I would say that at the Human Space Program, uh, our mission is very similar to what uh, Britt was talking about. Uh, one thing we've said before is you know, on Earth, we have developers and we have planners. And um, Elon's a developer, you know, and Jeff Bezos is a developer. And on Earth, you've got to have developers and then you've got to have planners because one without the other, you know, uh, without developers, nothing happens. Without planners, you just have chaos. And we need to work together. So that's what we want to do. And uh, like Celestial Citizen, we do use the metaphor of what happens here. And one thing about planning on the Earth, a good urban planner does try to involve everyone who will be affected. So if it's a city plan, you try to get all the stakeholders involved one way or the other. If it's regional, maybe or statewide, you try to get everyone involved. And what we're doing at Human Space Program is we're looking at some of the breakthrough techniques of Web 3.0 and blockchain uh, because we do want to create a plan. And what we intend to do is have it be citizen authored. And we want to use some of the technologies that are emerging today to give as many people as possible. Excuse me. Yes, I will talk about Leica. Uh, Macy Dobbs wants me to talk about dogs and their importance. Uh, yes, Leica was very important. Um, but uh, uh, we are working at the mechanism to do that because we do not want to cre create another plan created by elites that sits on the shelf uh, and nobody does anything with it. The other thing we're doing is we're creating a way of simulating various alternative futures off the planet and we're hoping to make that model available for everyone to work with, an open source model. I think it's going to take a lot of technology and as Rick pointed out, the technologies we have that are problematic are also the ones that create possibility. Uh, so that's that's one approach. 
And that's the one we're taking. Mm -hmm. Let me throw it back to Rick for a, a real quick uh, addition to that, if you've got one, Rick. Um, and then I'm, I'm going to need to wrap up with some acknowledgments and we can send everyone on their way. We can always after party, mm -hmm. but, uh, <clears throat> but any other thoughts on including everyone? Yeah, you're, you're a funny guy with the real quick thing, right? Um, so um, the look, don't take yes for an answer, right? And teach your kids not to take yes for an answer. Uh, this whole thing, like I said about this, the, the NASA program, don't buy it. Look into it. Understand what's going on. Look at what's really happening out there. And you know, maybe put your kids on a research project to compare the cost of what NASA is spending to put a person on the moon versus uh, what Elon's going to be spending to put her. I mean, whatever, depending on their age group, of course, right? Um, Put them into a place of question and put them into a place of, of demanding a better future. Don't roll over for the convenient answer. Don't roll over for the politically correct answer. Take a stand because literally life on earth. I'm not just, you know, people don't understand that if we blow this, if we blow the future, and by the way, space can help us in so many ways to save the climate. We don't have time to go into it. But if we blow the future, it's not this sort of cliche idea that the Mother Earth is going to, she's going to shrug us off and vines are going to cover all the cities and, you know, you know, cats are going to run free. That's not it. We're going full Venus if we get this wrong. Everything dies. Perhaps the one spark of life in the entire universe will be burned out. And I don't want to sound like overdramatic. It's kind of hard not to sound overdramatic on that one. But I, it, it's really what's at stake. The flip side of that is so much hope, so much excitement, so much possibility. I, I'm going to bet, and, and this is something really important. I'm going to bet. I, I did this. I spoke to a bunch of 14-year-olds. By the way, with the 14-year-olds, real quick, I, I said to them, hey, you're nerds. You're geeks. I'm nerd. I'm a geek. Your friends call you nerds. They call you geeks. In 20 years, they're going to call you boss. Study, study, study. But look, the kids get it. What happens in our society is we beat it out of them. They get it. They're wide-eyed. They're amazing. They're incredible. They're excited. You have, your job is, and I know I'm telling you your job, your, your teachers, you can tell me, your job is to keep that excitement going. Don't let it get crushed. But I'm going to bet that there are kids in your classroom right now who are either going to be a part of or lead groups of independent humans that may have nothing to do with commercialization. They may have nothing to do with NASA or ESA or any of the governments in the world or ISRO or wherever you're from. They're not going to have anything to do with that. They're going to get together with some other people who believe like they do, and they're going to decide it is their mission to go out there and create human communities in space. By the way, that's the word I use now. I don't use colonies, settlements, human communities beyond the earth. They're going to go out there. Why? Because they believe it is what they are here to do. And they're going to show up at Elon's door and say, Elon, okay, we've self-organized. We've created a DAO or whatever. We've got... $150 million or $500 million that we've raised, and we want to buy X number of starships to carry our first people there and 10 years of resupply. That will happen within the next five to 10 years, and some of your kids are going to be a part of either the first wave or the one that comes after. So back to you, Mark. Yeah, that's mind-bending. Mind uh, I, I love that we're on the cusp of it and that people... Uh, in this event are going to be uh be a part of it be witness to it get to empower uh kids to be a part of it so it is very very exciting uh note to end the day on um i'm going to say a few words by way of uh acknowledgments and, and wrap up here um maybe a, a little bit of a <laughs> a sense of resolution to the day uh, but first of all, if, if you guys could do this in Zoom style, a round of applause and gratitude for uh, Frank and Rick for coming and sharing with us today. Um, they, they put a lot of time and thought into all of this, and it's fantastic that that gets transferred to our brains via this magic over the Internet. 
Um, so thank you, Frank. Thank you, Rick, for, for being willing to come and being so generous uh, with your time. I want to also uh, thank my, my co-organizers in this event. So thank you, uh, Anahita and Ron and Gitika. Um, it's really fantastic to be able to work with you on this uh, over the course of the year and to put together three of these already. And I'm, I'm looking forward to, uh, to doing more and where we can, where we can take it. Uh, I also want to acknowledge our partner organizations. Uh, some of these, of course, are related are uh, related to our our co-planners. Um, but Earthscape VR, uh, I hope you guys will check that out. It's sort of bringing the overview effect to more people down here on Earth and putting it to good use. Uh, Aries Learning, of course, focused on uh, preparing students for all these things we're talking about. Celestial Citizen, if you didn't get a chance to hear Britt speak today, uh, check out her podcast. Uh, Ignited Thinkers. Uh, focused on space education, get a guy's great interview series there and, and other resources. And of course, uh, the human space program, uh, which is based on Frank's work. Uh, I also want to point you guys toward the overview effect now in its fourth edition. Uh, it keeps the, the primary documents in the back, keep growing more and more astronaut interviews uh, and, the, and the genesis of Frank's uh, framework. So I hope you guys will pick that up. Um, if uh, if somebody could drop a link in now, otherwise I'll do that at, in just a moment. Uh, Star Sailor, of course, that Anahita and Frank wrote together is a great way to introduce these ideas uh, to young children as too, if you are teaching them or have them in your life. Uh, of course, I've got to mention my own book, uh, Space Education. It's a more academic uh, volume, but focused on preparing students for humanity's multi-planet future. And the free open education resource I was lucky enough to get to produce with the Space Prize Foundation last year. You can now find that at spaceeducation.org. Um, I also am excited to also share that I have a new course for teachers and enthusiasts. Our first cohort is happening right now. Um, it's only about half teachers, so happy to have others in there as well. But arieslearning.com slash course will get you there. Uh, otherwise, I'll drop the, uh, the full link in here in just a moment. Um, for free, though, you can head over to spaceeducator.net um, on Facebook. I'll drop in the link again, too, in a, in a minute if R uh, Ron doesn't beat me to it. But this is a new Facebook group for uh, this crowd and for people in uh, similar communities around the, around the globe. I put in some resources to start, but I hope you guys will uh, share liberally there uh, as well. It's a good way for us to be connected uh, between events. Also invite you all to join the movement at the Human Space Program. Head over to humanspaceprogram.org. Uh, it is a nonprofit organization focused on this uh, central project of humanity, of uh, migration to the stars and establishing the communities that Rick and Frank were talking of. Um, you guys can uh, come there to uh, support the nonprofit with a donation. You can join the community. There's a number of projects. Uh, you can get right into the Notion website too and see the, the nitty gritty. So. I hope you guys will join us. Uh, finally, Elizabeth dropped this in the chat just moments ago, but NASA's uh, Earth Day poster for the year. I wanna wish everyone a happy Earth Day tomorrow. The timing of this event is uh, it's very purposeful in that respect. So I hope you guys are energized and we'll go around and celebrate and share uh, with the people in your life tomorrow. Uh, thank you all for being here. Thank you again to my co-organizers, to our capstone speakers and to everybody who participated today. I will stop sharing. Ron, we can probably stop the recording, but uh, I'm happy to stick around for a few minutes.